The Ballad of Johnny Arcane by Jim Nail, read by Jim Nail. Chapter 3, Lucy, Part 2. They went outside, each wearing nothing but identical linen robes. The heart of night was approaching, and the rain spoke whispered words on the leaves and branches. She led him through the maze of kettles and furnaces to a flight of steps carved in the fern-covered hillside above the bathhouse. A simple structure clung to the slope, one room, a porch, many window openings but no glass, an iron wood stove, now cold, an unmade bed with a patchwork quilt, a table, two chairs, Everywhere there were bells hanging, and from the porch stoop a series of tiny metal ladles descended on a knotted cord, catching the rainfall. As each ladle filled, it tipped and dropped its water into the ladle below, sending a clear bell tone as it, as it struck. Each ladle was pitched differently, and the result was a shimmering cascade of liquid melody. Lucy set about building a fire while Johnny sat at the table. She talked to him incessantly, but he couldn't make out what she was saying. It was as if she had slipped into another language or a baby's babble. Mostly, he just watched her, amazed by the delight she gave him. Soon there was some warmth in the room, although not enough to dispel the damp cold through the open windows. There was a knock on the porch. Lucy got up and returned with a tureen of something steaming and fragrant. It's our supper, she said. Please forgive poor Bow Wow. He can be so private. Because they were cold, they sat at the table shoulder to shoulder with Lucy's quilt wrapped around them as they ate their food directly from the tureen with bare hands. Johnny had no idea what it was. The sauce was yellow and spicy and there were some kind of soft crumbly curds and sweet strips of a fruit or vegetable he had never seen before. They drank mugs of rainwater direct from the cascading ladles on the porch. When the food was gone, Lucy fetched an amber glass bottle from under the bed and filled the mugs with a strong and fragrant brew. This will help us stay warm, she said. It was sweet and thick with spirits. It tasted like herbs, especially Woodruff and Damiana. While they drank, Lucy lapsed back into her other language. It sounded almost like singing, and it was clear she didn't care if he understood her. He let the sounds wash over him as he drank, as the drink went to his head. Then, suddenly, she drained her glass and looked directly at him. Come, sleep. It's been a long day, and we can keep each other warm. She pulled the quilt away and tumbled into the bed between the rumpled sheets. Johnny slipped in beside her. But of course, they did not sleep. The moment their bodies touched, they entered into a ritual established at the beginning of time. A sequence of precise motions, starting with fingers, then hands and mouths, then arms and legs, and finally the thrusting of whole bodies and the litany of cries and whispers, bursting at last like ripe dandelions, then release, the gradual slowing of breath, the calmed fingers curled lightly around the chalice of bare skin. 
They repeated the cycle seven times throughout the night. There was no need for sleep. No activity of the mind was required. No decisions were made. Through the open windows, the rain broke down the divisions of time into one continuous mo moment. And from the porch, the ladles crimed, chimed their rain-filled melody until it was completely forgotten. Somewhere between before dawn, they fell asleep in earnest. A knocking on the porch woke them. Lucy stumbled out of bed and threw on her robe. But by the time she got there, Bow Wow was gone. She returned with Johnny's backpack. Look, he washed your clothes and cleaned your bag. Johnny, what's this? It was the mandolin. He stared at it in wonder, as if it were a relic from a former life. How could he have carried it all this time without thinking of it, without playing it? He had not played it since he left home. It's an instrument, a mandolin. It makes music. Lucy frowned. It, it makes music all by itself? No, no, you have to play it. Here, let me show you. Johnny took the mandolin by the neck and strummed the strings. It was completely out of tune. But without hesitation, he launched into the, the first melody he could think of. The ashes of last night's fire. It could be anything or nothing. It was just a series of atonal plunkings in 6-8 time. But Lucy clapped her hands in delight. Oh, music! I love music. I can make music. I play the fiddle. Johnny stopped his fingers. So, it was you that I, that I heard that first night in the forest when I came here. Of course it was me. Who else do you think? Bow Wow? She reached under the bed and pulled out the most dilapidated old violin Johnny had ever seen. The wood was completely flat, the color of ebony, and there were notches carved up and down the neck and a sloppy picture of a yellow rose painted on the fretboard. On the, on the fingerboard, I'm sorry. The chin rest was missing and there were two small holes bored completely through the wood where it used to be. When she took the bow and rasped it across the strings, he knew at once it was no more in tune than the mandolin. But she seemed to make something that sounded like music with it, closer to the music of a coyote than that of a human voice. Play with me. Play your mandolin. So he played. He didn't know how to improvise in this strange tuning, so he played a familiar tune, Maggots in the Cornmeal. She didn't even stop to listen. She just started playing something else alongside it. But there was a drift to her cadence that attached itself to the phrasing of the melody and pursued it like a swarm of hornets. Their eyes met and she smiled. She was a kind of lovemaking. He launched into the bridge, the key, the key change completely lost to the dissonance of the strings. He returned to the A section and repeated the form seven, no, several more times, finally exiting the coda with a flourish. Keep going! Keep going! More music! They played together all that day and every day into the days that followed. Johnny dug into his memory bag of old standards while Lucy plowed ferociously through a stream of, of angular riffs that always seemed to complement the spirit, if not the tonal center of the moment. After a while, he began to loosen up and experiment with the melodies to sharpen a fourth or flatten a seventh or even shift into a different key entirely. It didn't matter. Nothing was what it seemed to be. And once, something strange happened. It was mid-afternoon. They were 
were working their way through this, shepherd calls the sheep when suddenly a great sadness overtook him and a string of sad memories flooded his mind. The morning he found the remains of Huxley and Vermilion in the wire pen devoured by wild pigs, only their ears and entrails left in the dust. The day his friend Osterman fell from the olive tree and broke his neck and died. The letter from his father, Caspar Arcane, brought by the messenger, how mothers broke his father's heart with her indifference. And later his father was killed by a flaming scarecrow. Johnny's eyes filled with tears, but before he could shed them, they dropped inexplicably into the music itself. And the music became first sad and then sweet, a tender sweetness like maple sugar, full of longing that hovered continuously on the brink of fulfillment. The tempo slowed, the harmonies blended, the moment pa passed, and he found his eyes dry and sparkling. At nightfall, Bow Wow left food on the porch. Lucy killed the fire. They wrapped in the quilt, sat at the table, ate and drank the rainwater from the ladles. Then she uncooked the amber uncorked the amber bottle, and they repeated the ritual of the night before, although this time with a little more sleeping. It rained for seven days and seven nights. Something brand new woke up in Johnny's heart. He had never felt anything so constant, a person beside him always, and not like mother, not like any of the girls in school. Someone small and vulnerable, yet strong and sturdy, like a crocus pushing through the snow. He felt his arms around her always, even when she wasn't beside him. He wanted to shelter her and protect her now and into the dark future. At the same time, he felt a power growing in his arms and legs. He felt like a giant walking on the land. He felt the boundaries of his body extending into the known world. The days became rituals. Lucy was always the first to wake. Johnny, let, Johnny felt her warmth slip away as she rose to stoke the fire and prepare the tea. He lingered half suspended in slumber until she called his name. Their morning conversations were formless, single words and phrases, bits of poetry, fragments of last night's dreams. Sometimes she lapsed into her other language. When she did this, she pulled away. She moved about the room, drawing pictures with her arms, making little leaps and catching invisible things from the air. But every now and then she glanced at him to see if he was watching. He was. Then they got their instruments out and played. They never tuned. Johnny didn't even mention the concept. The music they made was so far outside the conventions of melody and harmony, he gave up trying to call upon the old songs and followed her lead, emptying his mind of all content, pursuing the sound wherever it took him. Often it drove him straight into Lucy, the shape of her body, the fall of her hair, the bliss in her closed eyes as she pulled the bow across the strings. And then suddenly he would penetrate her through the thin membrane of her skin and he would fall into the vast harp-shaped kingdom of her soul where there were provinces of pleasure, preserves of mystery, and small shadowy pockets of foreboding and despair. Evening, Bow Wow brought the food and while they ate, they talked in earnest about real things. Johnny told her everything he could think of. 
He told her about his childhood, about the schoolhouse where, where he and seven other children learned how to write words and make pictures, how to care for animals, how to kill the ones you ate, and nurture the ones that gave you wool and eggs and milk, how to grow food from seeds and to chop wood and build a fire. He learned all the songs, first to sing and later to play on the mandolin. In the summer, there were dances. Sometimes as many as 50 people would gather from the neighboring villages, and they were often as many musicians as there were dancers. In school, they taught us there was once a time of fire and bandits, he said. But the fire killed all the bandits and then burned itself out. Still, we had to learn the rituals. We had to perform them every day to keep us safe. Mother honored the four directions, emptying the water from the sconces and refilling them with a pinch of fire great ash. At night, she swept all the floors, all the dust and bug bodies and cornmeal into a pyramid, and she whisked it into a platter and tossed it in the fire. It drove me crazy. It was foolish superstition. I had walked in all the four directions. She knew nothing about them, only the four walls of the house. Lucy made almost no mention of her past. She mostly spoke of the here and now, her life at the bathhouse. There was a family of foxes in the woods above the cabin. The baby foxes had eaten pumpkin seeds from the palm of her hand. Once a man with only one leg came to bathe. Lucy had washed the stump below the man's knee. It felt like leather. Bow Wow was teaching her how to carve wood. She showed Johnny the snakes and faces she had carved in the legs of her bed. The hills were full of caves, all connected. She had explored them with a carbide lamp. Wherever the caves opened up into the air, Bow Wow built an altar and he spent days moving through the caves, refilling the altar plates with food. There were all kinds of creatures you couldn't see, but you could talk to them if you learned their language. The creatures you couldn't see were all connected the way that mushrooms are connected in the forest. She knew of one mushroom deep in the forest that covered a whole hillside. It looked like, a, looked like hundreds of mushrooms all peeking through the moss but they were only one, all connected under the ground. She once watched a puddle of slime in a shadowy glade pull itself together and form a creature with tentacles and legs, and it crawled across the forest floor until it came to a patch of sunlight where it dissolved back into a puddle of slime. She watched the whole thing. It took all day. In the winter, it snows and everything falls asleep. Once a very old woman came to take a bath in the winter and after the bath, she fell asleep and she died. One morning, Johnny woke and found her standing in the corner of the room, going through a series of slow movements, shifting her weight from side to side, reaching and grabbing invisible objects and moving them about, setting them on the floor and lifting them, rolling them into balls, stretching them out like taffy, spreading invisible veils over her head and shoulders. Johnny, look! You can tell your mother this is how you utter the four directions. She kept moving, making large circles and caressing them into smaller circles. Bow Wow told me, there's something in the air. You can't see it, but messages can travel through it. It's called, he called it dough. You know, dough, like you use to make bread. You can play with this dough. You can move it around. It helps you, it helps to make you strong and happy. 
Get up, I'll show you how. He got up and stood beside her and tried to follow along. She had words for different actions, things like rocking the baby, uh, calling in the lambs, uh, sending out the falcons. He was awkward and clumsy, frequently stumbling. Once he bumped into her, but she just kept on moving. Still, he began to feel something, a kind of firmness, like a tree branch, like tree branches reaching for the sky. On some days, she had clients in the bathhouse. Then Bao Wa rang a bell and she would have to go. The first time she left, he felt himself gutted with uneasiness. When she returned, he said, these people you bathed, were they men or women? Oh, this time there were two men and a woman. Uh, the men, do you do to them what you did to me? A twinkle came into her eyes and she giggled. Johnny, you're jealous. Don't be jealous. It's just a function of the body. It doesn't mean anything. It's not like what we do, me and you, together in the night. I don't do that with anybody but you. She shook her head. Not now.